Let's take a look at this passage, and it's got some really, really good stuff in it, some stuff that can really be helpful, not only now, but as you go on through your Christian life. Why? There's going to be these temptations to depart from something that's a a term that's been used in different languages for many, many centuries about Christianity. There's a word. It's called simplicity. And you're going to be tempted by other people, maybe even by your own flesh, to turn away from the simplicity of the gospel to complexities that cannot save you. And and this is very, very, very important. Additions. Yes, you have Christ, but you need us. Yes, you have Christ, but you need this also. And, And you always have to be very aware of that. And that's something of what's going on here. So he says in verse 25, this is the promise which he himself... Now notice, he himself. You see? Um, if a representative makes you a promise, or even an ambassador makes you a promise, what are you wanting to know? Well, you're making the promise, but you don't have any authority to make the promise. The king has the authority to make the promise. So are you making it, or is it the king? And so he's saying, this is the promise which he himself made to us. Literally, this is the promise which he himself promised to us, eternal life. Now, remember, this is John. If you go back to the Gospel of John, he's what is you know what's probably the most famous verse, you know, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life or everlasting life. Now, um, that can sound a little bit carnal. Whoever believes in Him gets to live forever. All right, but that's not what eternal life means. It is a life eternal, but eternal life is referring more to a quality of life than it is a quantity of life. And so it doesn't just mean you live forever, but you live forever knowing Him. Now, in John chapter 17, he says this is eternal life. That what? That you know God, that you know Jesus Christ whom He sent. Now, know is a very important term in the Bible. It it doesn't just mean factual knowledge, but it can even mean intimate knowledge, all kinds of knowledge, relational knowledge. Okay? And so this is the promise He's given to you, not just eternal life, but not just living forever, but living forever in His presence in a perfect and unhindered relationship with Him. This is what He's promised. Now, John's writing, remember, to children. This is what he's promised you, children. You little children who simply believe or trust in what God did for you through His Son. He promised you eternal life. Not because you were able to carry out all kinds of complexities or obey all kinds of laws. Not because you had some esoteric hidden knowledge or an extremely high IQ. He promised you eternal life because you trusted in His Son. Now, then he says in verse 26, These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Well, how are they trying to deceive them? It seems here that they were saying to, and let me, I mean this in a proper fashion, to simple Christians, to people who were walking in simplicity, to people whose entire hope was Jesus Christ died according to the Scriptures for our sins. He was buried and He was raised according to the Scriptures the third day. Okay, People are trusting in this person and work of God. That's all they have. They have no boast about, I have all this hidden knowledge. They have no boast about, you know, I do all these things and I keep all these laws. I have this secret mystery about me. No, nothing. You see, that's what I mean by simplicity. Now, as I've often reminded you, because it's not very obvious, I'm old. I've lived a long time. And not as long as some, but at least longer than most of you. All of you. Um, 
And I've studied a lot. A lot. That's what I was doing today. Studying. But here's the thing I want you to see. The faith that saved me. Remember I told you when I was a college student I was converted and I went to a Bible study and they said turn to Philippians and I, I, I just laid the Bible aside like... You know, I'd memorize the whole book. The thing was, I didn't know where Philippians was, okay? But the th- I'm saved for the same reason now that I was saved then. None of my studies, none of all my things, languages, and everything else has added to that. I'm not more saved than I was as that young college student who couldn't even find the book of Philippians but I was trusting that Jesus Christ died for my sins. Don't ever lose that. And if you, one of you are called into the ministry and become some great Greek and Hebrew scholar or great theologian, if all that just adds complexity and burden and other requirements to that initial faith, then, then you've studied the wrong things. You know? You know, what is the greatest theological truth you've ever had? Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. Christ died for my sins. Okay? Now, and it appears that there were a group of people that were coming in and were taking mocking, it seems, this simple faith. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Now, The Christian life, you know, let's look at the center, the gospel. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose again from the dead. And we, forsaking trust in ourselves, forsaking trust in our good works, we trust exclusively in what He did for us, okay? Now, there's going to be two attacks against that. One is to say that on one hand, okay, you believe in Jesus Christ, um, the body doesn't matter, so what you do with the body is no big deal. So go sin, go do all kinds of horrible things, and it doesn't matter because what really matters is that you trust in Jesus. That's heresy. Okay. The other is rule and law and rule and law and rule and law and rule and law added and added and added and added. Both those things are dangerous. See, Christianity is like walking in a very narrow path, and on both sides, there's a dangerous ditch. An old friend of mine used to say this, Christianity is like walking on the edge of a razor blade. You see, you can walk, you can go a thousand miles this way and walk in error, and a thousand miles this way and walk in error, but to walk in the truth, it's a very defined path. Now, don't let that scare you thinking, oh, I've got to know all these things to walk in the truth. No, what John's going to tell them is forget about all these complexities and everything and abide in the thing you first heard. And that's what I'm telling you to do. You become great theologians or whatever. I'm telling you the key is to abide in the initial message you heard. Jesus died for your sins and you trust in Him. You see? Now, he says, verse 27... As for you. Now, why is he doing that? He's kind of cutting here. He's dividing this group into two. There's these false teachers with all their big knowledge and big words and mysteries and complexities. And he's going to say they're not even Christian. And he's going to say, it's like looking at them and saying, go away. And then looking to these believers who are kind of being mocked for their simplicity and saying, now as for you. He's making a distinction. You see that? As for you, the anointing which you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in Him. Now, this can get kind of confusing, and and some people have kind of twisted this into something it doesn't mean. Let's look at it. It's actually very simple. As for you, The anointing which you receive from Him abides in you and you have no need for anyone to teach you. He's kind of... Let's put it this way. That day you become a Christian. If if you have become a Christian. And there's joy. And there's a sense of, of forgiveness. And the love of God. 
and happiness and cleanness. And, 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 and it just, just feels right for the first time in your life. Okay, with that simple, you believed in Jesus. You can't find the book of Philippians, but you believed in Jesus. Okay? And what was happening was you believed the message, the saving message, and the Holy Spirit confirmed it in your heart. Not with visions or thunder clouds or lightning bolts coming down out of heaven or an angel named Gabriel coming and talk to you. No, but there was joy. There was peace. There was a sense of, oh my. So this is what it means to be alive. I feel I'm forgiven. I'm loved. Okay? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's the anointing he's talking about. The anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no one, you have no need for anyone to teach you. Now he's not going to deny that there are benefits to having teachers. What he's saying is this group that's come in here with all their stuff, you have no need of them. I know they're making themselves really big and making you really small, but let's go back to the beginning. That special joy you had when you were, became a Christian, that special love you felt when you became a Christian, that sense of security in your heart, that happened without these teachers. That happened and they were nowhere around. That happened without all their silly, deep information and knowledge and mysteries. Do you see that? And oh dear young person, listen to me. This is where you want to stay. This is where I've stayed. Maybe because I'm not that smart? No. It's really where I've stayed. There are things I marvel about. But there's one thing I rest upon. Jesus shed His own blood for me. And that's it. That, that's enough. You see? And I remember that day on that college campus when that happened that I, that I saw that He died for me and that my heart, it seemed like it had been dead. It was dead. And it came alive. And there was joy. And there was meaning. All I knew was Jesus Christ died for my sins. That was the Holy Spirit working. Alright? And that's what happened to these people. But now some group is coming in and saying, that's not enough. You're not there yet. And John's saying, you don't have any need for these people to teach you. Okay? Now, it says, but as His anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in Him. Now, he could be saying you are abiding in Him now without the help of these teachers. Or he's saying continue abiding in that first thing that you learned. Continue in that. And even though you may come to understand it at a more profound, le profound level, there's no message that be ever becomes more important than that message. You see? Abide in what you first learned when we preached the gospel to you and you had a sense in which your sins were forgiven and there was joy and life. Just keep going in that. Now, let me show you how important this is. Okay? Just for a moment, go over to go over to Galatians for a moment. Uh, that's a, um, a little bit further back, um, towards the front. It's one of Paul's epistles. In chapter three, verse one, he says, "You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified?" He said, "We preached Christ to you." in such a way that it is though you were seeing Him. And he says, This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And what he's saying is, so these Galatians had come to know about Jesus and trust in Jesus by faith. Then these Judaizers came in and started teaching them, no, you need to practice the law of Moses. You need to be circumcised. You need to... And he goes, stop, 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 hold it. Let's go back to the beginning. Did you need all that stuff before? Is the knowledge of all that stuff what brought you peace and life and joy and hope? No. And he uses a strong word, who has bewitched you? 
He'll even talk later about, you know, you were running well. Who cut you off? And, and that's what I want you to see. There are going to be things that are that people, ideas, they're going to try to attach themselves to the gospel and basically say the gospel's not enough. Don't, don't be bewitched by that. Okay? Not at all. I, I remember uh, two different cults that have at times come to me and tried to win me or whatever. And uh, Jehovah Witnesses and the, and the Mormons. And, and they'll always act like, we're Christians too, man. We believe what you believe, you know? And, and I remember one time, and this has happened with both groups. Uh, they said, I, I told them, well, you know, I, I believe Jesus, Son of God. We believe that too. Well, I, you know, I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I believe, we believe that too. I believe He rose again from the dead. Well, we believe that too. I believe we're saved by faith in Him alone. Oh, we believe that too. And I said, then why are you evangelizing me? What else do you have that I need that if I don't have, I'm not saved? If you say I'm believing what you're believing, then what? why are you trying to come and add something else? And they were. They were. They're always trying. There's something. Well, well, in reality, you also, I also what? I need your group. I need to be a part of it. Have to bear your name. Have to be a part of what? What are you saying? You see? There's always going to be that. You see? You want to be very, very, very careful of it. Look over in the book of Colossians for a moment. And we see the same thing in the book of Colossians. Look in chapter 2. Look in verse 6. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in Him. Do you see that? Continue in Him. You received Christ by faith. Now continue in that. Just continue. And then look what he says in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Beware of men who are going to come to you and tell you you need something more than Christ. Okay? In verse 9, For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in Him you have been made complete. I can't tell you how many times some cult or even some so-called pseudo-Christian group has come to me and says, yeah, you're on the right path, but you're not there yet. You're not complete. You need one more thing. And automatically, listen, young people, that's a red flag. Because that's exactly the opposite of what the Bible says. He's saying here, look what he's saying, verse 6, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, as you became a Christian, that one moment when you were, you know, brand new baby, continue walking in that, in that message. Okay? Why? Look what he says, verse 10, In Him you've been made complete. Now we're going to grow in that message. We're going to grow in our understanding of His will. But look what happens in verse 16 of chapter 2. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. You see? What's going on? Adding something to Christ. Yeah, you, you need Jesus by faith. You also need to be circumcised. You also need to keep the law. You also need to keep the Sabbath. You also need to do this. Do you see? And Paul says, no. As a matter of fact, look at verse 18. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Here's people that are boasting about, I fast more than you guys. So I'm obviously a Christian. You're not. I suffer. I make my body suffer. I beat my body. I do this. I do that. You don't do that. You're lacking this. Okay? And then worship of angels and taking His stand on visions He has seen. Yeah, you're trusting in Christ, but you're just, if you are saved, you're so immature because, you know, what visions have you seen? 
What communications with angels have you had? What dreams? What miracles? What kind of gifts do you have? All of this is, is nothing compared to Christ. Okay? And he says that people that hold on to these things in verse 19, they're not holding fast to the head. How do you hold fast to the head? Simple faith that God became a man, walked upon this earth, lived a perfect life, went to a cross, on that cross, bore your sin, suffered the wrath of God, paid full payment for all your transgressions, died and rose again on your behalf. And you're trusting in Him. That's where you stay. Now, let's go back to, to 1 John. And he says in verse 27, And you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as His anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, abide in Him. Just as it's taught you from the beginning. How did you learn the Gospel? Through the Holy Spirit. Even though people were showing you Bible verses and things like that, the Holy Spirit is the one that opened your mind and bore witness to the truth. Okay? And He's saying, just keep going in that. And let me tell you a story. It's one of the most wonderful stories of, of my life. I love telling this story. I was up in a town just a few kilometers south of Alaska in uh, British Columbia, and I was preaching. And uh, there, were more, there were more grizzly bears, actually, in the town, in, well, in the area, than there were people. I mean, it was a little small church. And right when I got ready to preach... Um, some door, the doors opened up in the back and this mountain of a man, he was at least, I don't know, 65 or 70 years old, but he was just a mountain of a man. I mean, his fingers were like that big. And uh, just the saddest person I've ever seen. He walked in and he sat down on the front row. And I just, man, I just started preaching the gospel. And he would look so sad. And he had a manila envelope about this big. And so after I finished my sermon, I went right down to him and I said, Sir, what's wrong? And he, he pulled an x-ray out of the manila envelope and he said, They just told me I'm going to die. And he said, I've lived out on a working cattle ranch all my life. You can only get there by horse or float plane. He said, I've never been scared of anything. But I, I know there's a God and I'm scared. And I said, well, you heard the message, right? He said, yes, I did. Did you understand it? He said, yes, it was clear. And then he said something. He goes, but is that all? I understood it. Is that it? I'm going to die. I understood the message. I understood it was clear. A child could have understood what you were saying. Is that it? And so I said, sir... I'm supposed to fly out of here tomorrow, but I'll cancel my flight. And here's what we'll do. I'll sit with you with the Bible until the Lord saves you or you die. And I said, let's start right now. So I it's a little church and we're in Harleen Bay there. And so I started, where does faith come from? From hearing. The Holy Spirit uses the Word, right? And so what did I do? I mean, Old Testament, New Testament, I just started taking him through promises that the one who believes, the one who trusts in the Lord, the one who trusts in the Gospel, has eternal life. And I mean, we went on for over an hour. And I said, so, do you understand? He goes, yeah, I understand. Is that it? I said, no. He said, I, I mean, I see it, but... You know what? There's nothing else. And he goes, "I'm going to die. Do I do I die just knowing that I understood this?" I said, "No. Is is it? Are you believing it? Is it you throwing yourself upon it? Do you see it? See it?" He said, "No." So I said, "Okay, let's start again." Went through a few verses, and we got back to John three sixteen. And we'd already read John 3.16 several times, my favorite verse in the Bible. And I said, Let, let's read John 3.16 again. And he goes, okay. And he had my Bible like this in his lap. And I remember big old hands. 
And he goes, okay, uh, I'll read it. And he goes, For God so loved the world that He gave His Son. And I mean, His hand, He just started shaking. And His tears just... He said... that whoever believes has eternal life. He goes, I I have eternal life. He goes, I have, I have eternal life. And I said, how do you know? And you know what he said? Haven't you ever read this verse before? Do you see what happened? He had read it and read it and read it, but what happened? What John calls the anointing. Do you see that? The Holy Spirit. What? You know, just like me. I mean, I was a kid. My mom drugged me to church. They preached the gospel there. I never saw it. I never heard it. I could have explained it to you like a parrot. But one day in the library of the University of Texas, it was like, He died for me. Me. I mean, I see it. I see it. You see? It may not be that dramatic, but it's always the same with someone. And, and that's why when I'm, I'm showing someone about Jesus, I trust in the Word. I just take them through to the promises. And I don't say, oh, you understand it? Let's pray a prayer. I'm not going to treat people like that. I'm going to take them through the promises, explain and take them through the promises until they go, you know what? I see it. I, I see what you're... I see it for myself. See, the Holy Spirit bears witness, opens up their eyes, and they see it, you see. And that's what He's saying. This has happened to you. And it happened to you before all these people came with all their silly stuff, their super spiritual stuff, okay? So reject that that stuff and just keep going in the very message that you had. I knew this girl on campus at the University of Texas, and... She was, I mean, man, she, she had so much energy and she was so funny and she just all kinds of things. But And she read her Bible all the time. But man, she was just like a little girl when it came to faith in Christ. It was like a child. Just, you know, she wasn't a great theologian, but man, she Jesus loves me, this I know. And I mean, her whole life was just a simple, trusting In Jesus Christ. She loved to study and learn about other things, but that was her thing. One thing I always remember, because I was a waiter in her her dorm. It was a girl's dorm. And uh, she'd walk out, you know, sometimes I'd be walking out the same time she'd walk out. It'd be a beautiful morning. She could just go, look at that, Paul. Way to go, God. Way to go. (laughs) She was just, everything was so, she was like a little girl. But that, that was it, man. But see, that one thing of trusting in that simple message, she would have stared down lions in an arena. I'm confident of it. She would have died for her faith. A simple yet extremely powerful, Jesus died for me. And that's my hope. And that's what John's telling them. Now he says in 28, Now little children, abide in Him. Continue. Continue in Him. Continue in what you learned. And he says, So that when He appears, we may, not, we may have confidence and not shrink away from Him in shame at His coming. Now, this doesn't mean that there are going to be genuine believers who are going to shrink away from Him at His coming. What he's talking about is, how do you know that you really are a Christian? It's because you continue in this hope, in this singular, simple hope. Okay? So now imagine. Now, it's the closest I'm going to get to drama. So imagine you got this person who says they're believing in Jesus, okay? Trusting in Christ, simple Jesus died for me and rose again from the dead. All right? And he's enough. Jesus is enough. Then all these false teachers come in, okay? 
and start telling you, no, you need to be circumcised. No, you need to keep the law. It's Sabbath. You need to eat this way. You need to do this. You can't do that. You've got to add all these different things. And this person listens to that. That Christ isn't enough. Okay? That the gospel isn't enough. And so they go over here and they join to this. Yeah, Jesus is part of it. But He's not all of it. And then imagine. They, let's say that they've got great, brilliant theories and philosophies and they, they fast four times a week and they go to church every day and they tithe a hundred percent. You know, they eat air. I mean, they just... They, they've got all this stuff. But when Christ comes back and they see Him as He is and, and they, in the light they see themselves as they are, they will literally be ashamed. I trusted in don't eat this. I trusted in the observance of certain days. I trusted in these stupid philosophies. I said that Christ wasn't enough. Do you see that? That's what he's talking about. Now, if you're a genuine Christian, you're over here in this camp. Who's your boast? What is your boast? Christ his death and resurrection. Now, as a Christian, can these guys tempt you and deceive you? Yeah, they can. Can you even go over there for a moment and think, man, you're super spiritual and everything else? Yeah, you can. But if you're a true Christian, you know what God's going to do? Sooner or later, He's going to grab you by the collar and pull you right back over here. And you're going to think, I was the, you, I was, how could I have been so stupid? How could I have been so blind? And every time you wander, he'll, he'll, he'll pull you back. And when He pulls you back, you're going to be like, how, how could I... I mean, how could I think that added something to Christ? Really? Gosh, how stupid! Alright? And, and that's what he's getting at here. You know, don't run over to these other things because they don't save. And if, even if they come out of the Old Testament, they were a shadow, a type of the fullness that was to come. And the fullness is Christ. The fullness is the gospel. Don't go back to the shadow when the real things come here. I mean, on your wedding day, guys, what do you want to dance with? The, the shadow of your bride or your bride? Do you see? Hold on to this one thing. That, that my only hope, my only glory, my only boast is Jesus Christ died for sinners. Jesus Christ died for me. That's it. And those who have that, even though they may be great scholars, those who have that, when Christ comes back, they're not ashamed. But when He comes back, His light will shine on this other stuff. And it will be like, well, garbage. It, 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 like, oh, how could I have done that? It's the same way with a, with a lost uh, person who refuses to believe the gospel and they think that they're righteous and they don't need a Savior. They may think that now, but when He comes back and His light shines on that, they're going to cry out you know, for the, to, for the rocks to fall upon them, to hide them. Because they're going to see themselves as they truly are. And so that is what he's getting at. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to what? To the cross I cling. My only hope. Okay? Now, now he's going to go on and say something else here. Verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who is born, you, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Now, remember I said there's two types of deviations. There's adding a whole bunch of laws and rules to the gospel that the Bible doesn't give us. But there's another deviation. And these kind of false prophets here, maybe were the, the roots of what later became Gnosticism. Um, 
That's the way they were. They were a contradiction. Some of these characters, man, had every kind of law and you don't eat this and uh, you can't get married and all sex is bad and you name it. They, they were against everything. They were legalists, you could say. But there was another part of them that was the opposite. That they basically said this, the body's not important. The only thing that's important is spirit. And so you can do whatever you want to do with the body and it doesn't matter. It won't be bad. Because we're spiritual beings and God is spirit, so the body doesn't matter. So you want to get drunk, you want to commit immoralities, you want to do all that, that's okay, just go ahead, it's no big deal. And remember what I said about Christianity being a narrow path and there's ditches on both sides? There are ditches on both sides. And this is the other side of that ditch. That, well, in America, kind of, it goes this way. I believe in Jesus. It doesn't matter if I live like the devil. Well, we do know this. Salvation is not dependent upon your ability to walk in holiness. And if you do walk in holiness, it doesn't add one thing to your salvation. Salvation is by faith. But what we see throughout all the New Testament is those who have truly believed, their hearts have been changed. It doesn't mean that they don't struggle with sin and they don't struggle with apathy because I struggle with sin and apathy till today. But I hate my sin and I hate my apathy and I am changing and I am growing and I do want to walk in righteousness. So avoid legalism on one side. Avoid living in sin and immoralities on the other. Okay? Because he says... If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of Him. Now, I think John's probably also referring back to this group of false teachers who are not righteous, who are very wicked, very immoral. And he's saying, look, these guys are wanting to be your teachers. They're not even born of God because you know anyone who's born of God is going to practice righteousness. They don't practice righteousness. You know another thing I'd like to tell you? Do you know what I've discovered? Whenever you see legalism, I mean really, in legalism, I mean making up rules and laws that God never made and forcing them on people. And Wherever you see legalism, you'll see immorality. It's almost as if the legalistic teachers are trying to mask their own immorality or, or something or find victory over it. But in places where the gospel's not center and law is center and self-righteousness and ability to do certain things and not do certain things, you will also find corruption. It seems to always be the case. Now what you want to be is someone who trusts only in Christ and seeks to walk simply with Him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. The simple commands of the gospel and the simple commands of Scripture, the simple uh, statements of wisdom, you seek to know them, embody them, live them out, but all under the rule of love. You see? Very simple. Very simple. Now, he's going to go on, and maybe we'll have to save this for next week, chapter 3. And he's going to go on to talk about um, the greatness of God's love for us and what will happen when Christ appears. And uh, we don't have time to get into that, I don't think, tonight. Um, because there's several different things that I, I want you to see in that passage that will be beautiful for you. But, but now let's just summarize. If you're a Christian... Remember that day that you became a Christian when you saw that salvation was through faith in Christ. Remember the joy. Remember the peace. And then remember this. All the complexities and rules and laws and everything else, you did not know them. And yet salvation was granted to you by faith. All the mysteries, you did not know them. So obviously they are not important for your salvation. 
the thing that you knew that saved you, continue walking in it. Mature in it. Mature in your understanding, but continue walking in it. And oh, my great prayer for you is that the older you get in the faith, the more simple your faith will become. And the more, the more you will realize you have no hope except Jesus Christ. If, if someone asked me the day after I was converted, do you have any hope other than Jesus Christ? I would have said no. But you ask me that now, and I'll still say no. But I think I understand it a lot better. Because as time goes on, and not in a morbid way, but as time goes on, you see how needy you are. Yet, as time goes on, you see more of His grace and more of His love. You see? In one sense, a Christian is kind of like a walking contradiction. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, and yet we're told of joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I know it's hard to believe, but both those things increase at the same time. Because the more I see of Him, the more I see of me. The more I see of me, the more I see of my need, my sin, my lack of love, my apathy, all sorts of things. But that does not lead me to despair. Why? Also, the more I see of Him, the more I see of Christ. And the more I see that that the blood of Christ, the love of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ is greater than my sin. And that I stand before God perfect, not in myself or my performance, but in Jesus Christ my Lord. You see? He's everything. Plus nothing. All right, let's pray.